Do I need a subwoofer? Uh, well, yeah, of course I need a subwoofer. In fact, I think I probably need two of them. That is the design philosophy behind this thing right here. These are the Dynas, which were designed by Nick over at Toyd's DIY Audio. Dynas is an acronym. It stands for, do I need a subwoofer? The idea is that a pair of these bookshelf speakers should not need an external subwoofer. That's because instead of using a mid-range driver in each cabinet, this design uses these Tang Band five and a quarter inch inch compact subwoofers. So I'm going to build a pair of these Donnas and we're going to find out if you need a subwoofer. Nick over at Toyd's DIY did me a solid and he sent me a flat pack that he cut on his CNC machine. He sells these flat packs. I'll be sure to give you some information down in the video description so you can find one if you think you'd like to try this build. Now flat packs are great if you don't have a lot of tools on hand, but if you like to do your own woodworking, Nick also sells the plans for the Dynas over on his website. In addition to the flat pack, Nick sent me all the crossover parts and I ordered all of the drivers from Parts Express. I'll give you links to the drivers down in the video description. I always do a dry fit before I assemble an enclosure and when you do a dry fit with a CNC kit you really see the brilliance of it. All the pieces just kind of snap together and the best way to assemble a CNC kit is to try to assemble as much of it at the same time as you can. So I'm going to lay everything out on the table, put some glue in all of the dados and the rabbits and then just kind of fold everything together. Before I do that I'm going to drill a hole in this piece right here. This is going to be part of the chamber that separates the mid-range from the subwoofer and I'll need a hole so I can run my speaker wire into that chamber. Now if I had a time machine I would do this a little bit different. I drilled right in the center of that piece. I would advise you to offset it a little bit so that the speaker wire doesn't interfere with the vent on the back of the speaker magnet. So if you decide to build these, you can learn from my mistakes instead of making the mistakes on your own. Let's talk about that mid-range for a second. This is a four inch driver with an aluminum cone and a phase plug. This is a full range driver and it's part of Dayton Audio's reference series drivers. So I'm gonna fold everything up and glue it all together in one step, everything except for the baffle. And really the best way to do this all in one step is to use some strap clamps. I got these strap clamps from Harbor Freight. I absolutely don't recommend the ones from Harbor Freight because this big long strap just gets in the way. You've gotta thread it through and it's a pain to work with. Instead, what I recommend you do is spend a little bit more money and get these Bessie clamps here from Amazon. These Bessie clamps have this spool on them that holds the unused straps so you don't have this wad of strap laying around in the way when you're trying to glue these up. Before I glue the baffle on I'm going to run some 16 gauge speaker wire through the hole that I drilled a little bit ago and use some hot glue to seal the hole and hold the wire in place. I went ahead and did this at this point in the build before I put the baffle on because I wanted to make sure I could get in there in order to apply the hot glue. It turns out there's plenty of room. You don't have to do this step before you put on the baffle. Now I want to point out that I'm not using any mechanical fasteners for this build. That's because wood glue is plenty strong. The wood glue is actually stronger than the wood after the glue has had time to set up. A good idea is to clamp everything together and then work on the crossover while the glue is setting up. For the finish, I'm using a product called Unicorn Spit. Now a viewer told me about Unicorn Spit and so I thought I'd give it a try. It comes in a wide variety of wild and crazy colors. It is a concentrated gel stain. The people that make it recommend diluting it in water when applying it. And you can mix it together and make all the kind of crazy and wild colors. A little bit goes a long way and you can even dilute it, which is what I'm doing here. I'm gonna be taking some blue unicorn spit and diluting it with equal parts of Minwax poly shades. Now the unicorn spit people say that you can't do a clear coat of this poly shades because it's water-based over the top of your unicorn spit. They recommend doing a clear coat of some kind of oil-based sealer over the top of it. But if you mix it with poly shades first, you can come back over it with a clear coat of the poly shade. It's pretty easy to apply. You just brush it on with the wood grain. As you can see though, it is a really dark and vibrant color and it pretty much covered up all the wood grain. It was almost like paint even after diluting it. I really wanted the wood grain to show through a little bit more and I hit it with some 220 grit sandpaper. And after doing that, you can really see the wood grain, but that really bright vibrant blue turned into this chalky powdery blue 
blue and I wasn't really happy with the look. So I thought, why not try to put a clear coat of the poly shades on it? And that's how I got this really nice, vibrant blue finish on this thing with just a little bit of the wood grain peeking through. Kind of has a rustic look to it. I was really happy with the way the finish turned out. So I, I'd recommend the Unicorn Spit, especially some of these crazy colors. If you want to do a unique project, I don't think there's anything else out there on the market with colors like this. Now it always takes time for the stain and the clear coat to dry and the smart thing to do is to work on the crossover while all that's drying. Since this is a three-way design, the crossover is just a little bit intimidating. So what I ended up doing is building the crossover in zones. There's a zone for the subwoofer and then a separate zone for the mid and the tweeter. And then from the terminal cup, I've got two positive wires, one going to each zone and two negative wires, one going to each zone. I like to use clear acrylic for my crossover board simply because I like the look, even though I'm going to put it in a box and no one's going to see it. At least I know that I'm happy with the crossover board and the way it looks. Another trick that I've learned over the years, I like to grab a black and a red Sharpie and label the connection points on the crossover board. These things get to be a little bit confusing, wires going everywhere, and so having some labels helps a whole lot. Another thing I like to do is I like to use some black and red shrink wrap whenever I connect the speaker leads to the crossover itself. I know what's positive, I know what's negative when I go to connect to the actual speakers. The most complicated part of mounting the drivers is mounting the tweeter. You've got to get the tweeter in exactly the right spot. This crossover is designed to have the tweeter set back a specific amount from the front of the baffle. So this tweeter comes with a mounting plate. The idea is that you screw the mounting plate to the enclosure and then there's a third hole to pass your speaker wire through. The tweeter then slides into the mount, the wire holds it in place. One of the problems is that the speaker wire hole is lined up exactly with the internal baffle that separates the mid-range from the subwoofer. So you gotta go in at an angle. Now here is a tip if you mess up this part, the mount is gonna be covering any holes that you happen to drill in the wrong place. Just take a little bit of CA glue and some accelerator and you can plug those holes up and there won't be any air leaks. Now it's time to mount the other two speakers, the mid-range and the subwoofer. Now I've got into this really bad habit of just putting the driver down and then with the driver in place, pre-drilling my screw holes. And I've had several viewers call me out on that and say that's kind of sloppy and I should do a better job. So I'm making a very conscious effort to go through the extra trouble to use this punch here to mark the holes before I go and pre-drill them. I always recommend pre-drilling holes it's not as critical on plywood like this enclosure but if you're using MDF you absolutely have to pre-drill these holes well now it's time to find out the answer to the big question how do these things sound and do I need a subwoofer now if you caught the last sound advice live stream you are aware that there is a little bit of a backstory behind my sound quality test now if you want to catch the next sound advice live stream we stream Monday nights at 7 p.m. either on my channel or on Nick's channel Make sure you subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell so that you don't miss it when we go live. As far as those tweaks I used to clean the sound up, basically I switched out to a different amplifier and my first amplifier was a little bit dirty. It didn't sound good. The amplifier I ended up using has a simple tone control and without even adjusting the tone control, the sound was already a whole lot better. So obviously the first amplifier I tried was a bad amplifier. Now this amplifier does have a very basic simple tone control. And when you turn that tone control all the way to the bass Side, that little five and a quarter inch subwoofer really comes alive. So now it's time to answer the big question. Do I need a subwoofer? Well, if you're using these as intended, as a bookshelf speaker, or maybe a speaker on your computer desk, you absolutely don't need a subwoofer. That five and a quarter inch driver, believe it or not, produces plenty of bass. Obviously this will not work out for like a home theater setup. If you want to hit those low notes for those explosions and low frequency effects, you are going to need a much larger external subwoofer. It's highly recommended that you do some equalization on these speakers. At the very least, you need an amp with a simple tone control. But you're probably asking, how can this little five and a quarter inch speaker make so much bass? Well, here's the secret. You probably noticed a great big hole in the side of the enclosure when I was putting this thing together. That hole was for this right here. 
An eight inch passive radiator. The best way to get a lot of bass out of a small space is to use a passive radiator. To learn more about passive radiators, check out this video right here. And before I go, I want to say thank you to all of my patrons with a special thanks to my $10 patrons listed right here and a shout out to $25 patrons Dylan, Bo, and Baba. I'm the DIY Audio Guy. I will see you on the next adventure.